Hi, my name is Jody. I work at Gear Library, and I am here to share a books talk with you about the books and resources that we have in the library about gardens. A great place to start is beginning basics. How do you set up a garden? A classic place to get your information on gardening is Old Farmer's Almanac. Um, there's also a lot of really great books about how to get your garden started if you're a new gardener. There's also wonderful gardening books if you want to share your love of gardening with any kiddos in your life. Picture books or project books that are specifically designed for the young reader Two really great books for getting your hands dirty uh, is, of course, the classic Old Farmer's Almanac. We get in a new edition every year. You can also look back at previous editions, and those give you a month-to-month -month guide of what to plant, where to plant, when to plant, and just uh, classic uh, Americana farming living folklore. It's good stuff. Another really wonderful resource if you want to know more about how a garden works or why a garden works is a newer approach to gardening in the form of a graphic novel. Maker Comics is a great series of how-to, but not just how, it's why. It's also just a wonderful resource if you know a lot about gardening but want a more visual explanation of how and why things work. The Grow a Garden includes wonderful diagrams of how to compost, why to compost, what does compost give your garden. It's a really adorable story about garden gnomes that are going to school so they can learn how to be grown-up garden gnomes. And they walk through what earthworms do and what sunlight does and what water does for the garden. And it's a very, very fun, very neat way to introduce a curious kiddo or a curious adult who just wants to know a little bit more about garden, very much in the spirit of, let's say, a Magic School Bus episode. Other classics that everyone loves to share with young ones in their lives or to just revisit for themselves, of course, it's Beatrix Potter is probably the first name people think of when they think of authors that write about gardens and gardening and the, the critters that we share our gardens with. Of course, there are other classics about this, like The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. I'm pretty sure everybody's favorite is probably Beatrix Potter. But there aren't just books about Beatrix Potter. There is actually a lovely film that was made in 2006 called Miss Potter. And it is the story of how a young independent woman uh, in the 19th century was able to get her work published and distributed to an audience and publication that included her wonderful hand-painted illustrations of her garden friends. Uh, this movie is very well produced. The costuming's beautiful. A lot of it is filmed in the north of England, where she had her her grounds that are now national parks. It's also very fairy tale like uh, in the way that they do present her characters and, and familiar faces like Peter Rabbit and Tabitha Twitchit and evergreen favorites. And it's you know it's not the only adventure that you can have in a garden. It's like if you want to inspire somebody you know to try gardening or to delve into a book that means a lot, you know, a, an approach through enjoying a movie together is a really, really fun place to start. It's also just an excellent biographical work. They stay very true to Beatrix Potter's actual life events and it features Ewan McGregor and there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, when you talk about gardening, you want to talk about growing fruits and vegetables because who doesn't love eating something fresh from their own garden or from grandma's garden or uncle's garden? The library, of course, has so many great resources. There's books and magazines, Mother Earth News Magazine, Lots of wonderful books of what to grow, how to grow, when to grow. Um, my focus here for growing food and, and really any other gardening is the books we have available that are especially pertinent to growing things in eastern Nebraska, but also in a small space. I am a container gardener. I have a 6 by 12 deck and a bunch of containers and a windowsill, and I love my garden even though I have a little more prep work and a little less help from pollinators some years.
really great gardening books, of course, for your small spaces. And even if you did have a full yard, if you didn't want to be gardening on the full third acre of your property, it's like a great small space garden is One Magic Square Vegetable Gardening. And it makes really neat concepts. Uh, the picture I included here is a, a theme garden. You know, if you don't want to do a traditional full spread of onions and potatoes and marigolds and tomatoes and all of that, it's like, well, what, what do you want to grow your garden for? And this particular example is grow a pizza garden. There are other ideas like growing a salsa garden, narrowing down your choices of what to put in the garden to match the space and the effort and the passion that you have. Uh, the Kitchen Garden is a month-by-month -month guide, and it's, of course, a bigger, chunkier garden book. It's full of gorgeous pictures, and it walks through more of the step-by-step, -step, really dig in, almost a full-time workload. It's just the big, more traditional, I'm growing a garden, go get what we're having for dinner out of the garden book. It's really great resources, wonderful photos. I chose a photo of the scarecrow um, because it's fun and dealing with pests, keeping birds out of our huckleberries and snails out of our tomatoes is a problem that I think all gardeners really bond over. So it's nice to have recommendations that you might not have thought of. Another great resource is, of course, Midwest Fruit and Vegetable Gardening. I grow and harvest the best edibles. And it is a great book that actually includes climate maps and specific recommendations and seasonal recommendations for the part of the country that we're living in. It can be hard to find other than just the broad climate zones of Zone 5 that Eastern Nebraska is in that actually talks about our wind problems, our late frost problems, you know, our, what kind of soil we're looking at. And it's really nice to have the deep, in-depth, proper Midwest look at how to really make the most out of your garden. Of course, not everybody wants to grow food. And that, of course, leads us to classic uh, grasses and flowers that you want to grow in your garden because they're beautiful. They feed the bees and they make us happy. And really great resources that the library has. You can do anything from specific, very focused books, um, like Wild About Weeds by Jack Wallington is a very specialized look at the kind of garden you want to be growing. I and mean, his focus is on wildflowers. Or you can have the big old chunky coffee table books like the Insect. Encyclopedia of Grasses for Livable Landscapes or, uh, you know, Martha Stewart's Martha's Flowers. And of course, if you're sharing any of these gardening books, they're all going to be beautiful to look at. And a, a younger reader would be happy to look at the pictures with you. But we also do have lots of fabulous picture books about flowers and gardens. And Bloom Boom by April Polisayer is really probably one of the most visually striking books. It's really more like a, a Georgia O'Keeffe painting collection than just a picture book. It's absolutely lovely. Two of my favorite books about growing flowers focus, of course, on the movement right now in gardening that you're hearing about that's re-emphasizing wild plants, local plants, indigenous plants, plants that'll feed our natural native pollinators and bring back things like our bees and our moths and our hummingbirds. Wild About Weeds, I already mentioned by Jack Wallington, is delightful. He is a fan of flowers and wildflowers, things like buttercups and poppies and clover. You know, you might traditionally think like, oh, I don't want the dandelions in my lawn, but he really does a beautiful job representing the more common pests, the things that, you know, grow on the cracks of sidewalks as something that you can put as the, the crown jewel in a garden for your own enjoyment, but also for the benefit of nature. And, you know, having grown, spent so much time in Nebraska, I, I don't think of poppies as being a wild local flower, but he's from the UK. So he's talking about things like the Welsh poppies, but we do have our own California poppy here in the U.S. So it is certainly a weed, depending on where your garden is, is located, because a weed is not really nothing more than just a plant that you didn't plant. So it's a, it's a fun perspective he presents in just his book, Having Fun with What's Going in the Garden. Another wonderful resource is called Plant This Instead uh, by Tori Martin. And this book is a really neat guide to the classics that you see in gardens, tulips, daylilies, black-eyed Susans, but then making recommendations of the variety of those plants that are going to be more drought-resistant, more hardy, more adaptable to people's individual climates to make them fit in their gardens more successfully, to more successfully attract pollinators, to last longer, to be a better bang for your buck. We all know gardening is expensive. 
how do I get the most out of a plant that I want to grow to be pretty that may or may not be successful on my third floor east facing stone back deck instead of somewhere more protected from the wind or somebody's beautifully cloistered greenhouse. So it's got a lot of really rec great recommendations in this book of what to choose instead. You like the daylily? What do you like about the daylily? Is it just the shape? Is it the color? So um, Martin makes gives you options of what, what you can choose instead of the, the more traditional, obvious uh, florals. But the emphasis is still on creating that eye-catching moment of, wow, that you are getting from these classics. Tulips and daylilies and roses and black-eyed Susans are, they're popular and they've been used forever in gardens because we like them. So finding something that will still give you that that spark of joy is is the emphasis uh, in this book. And it's, it's just really fun to look through too. Of course, you can't have gardening books uh, if you, you're not having books about arranging flowers. That's why we grow the flowers so we can so we can look at them and enjoy them. Martha Stewart, of course, perennial favorite for design and color choice, has a fabulous collection of books. Uh, the one I featured here is called Martha's Flowers. Just wonderful ideas for how to cut your flowers and display them in a way that you and guests or somebody you would gift the bouquet to can really make the most of the color and shape and form of the, the flowers that you have gone to the trouble of either growing or bought at Hy-Vee, you know. Whatever, no judgment. I especially liked this particular Martha Stewart book because the, the flowers that she focuses on just happen to all grow really well in southeastern Nebraska. There's pages on tulips and sunflowers and, of course, delphinium. And, you know, those are flowers that you can drive around and see here. And it's nice to have a design book that's just not like, well, here are these amazing equatorial plants that we'll never have outside in Nebraska. So it's, it's nice that the, the designs are not only beautiful and fun to look at, but it's actually a practical resource that we can enjoy here, too. I've also included uh, some photos of my own flowers. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a gardener. I love my plants. So having having flowers just in the house in the spring is it's a delight and it lightens up a room. And so I, I'm sharing my newest acquisition, which is columbines and daisies and some black mambo petunias. They're just they're a little little different, a little more new unique, and just having a good time with them. They're funky fun. Of course, more uh, flower arranging books, Arranging Flowers from Your Garden by Cynthia Bix and Philip Edinger. Absolutely breathtaking photos. A lot of great ideas for the kinds of containers to put the flowers in, not just, you know, a vase or whatever Tupperware container you happen to have on hand when your kiddo brings in a fistful of, of clover and, and dandelions from the yard. Just really, really wonderful, thoughtful creations that are really look like something you'd see hanging in an art gallery. Really fantastic. Fantastic. And of course, it's not just flowers that we grow. A good Midwesterner, and I love my grasses. Uh, there's an amazing resource, the Encyclopedia of Grasses for Livable Landscapes by Rick Dark. Absolutely spectacular book. Big old massive coffee table book of just grasses in gardens and private homes and in the wild from all over the world. He features pictures from Germany and New Zealand and England and South Africa and the United States. It's just you can see all these incredible, rich variety of grasses that we have to choose from. Things like papyrus and fountain grasses and blue stems and just really incredible grasses that can create such stunning, unique landscapes. And you don't think of grasses as having flowers necessarily, but it, you know, they do, they do bloom. They do have a season and it's just really, really cool to see the extent of variety that you can get. And the photo from the encyclopedia that I included here is from our own Lords and Gardens in Omaha. It's the Victorian brick garden that in the spring usually features breathtaking variety of tulips and things, but this one's done late summer. And there's papyrus and beautiful red grass, and it's striking. It's like no no one would walk into a garden with those kinds of just wonderful structural plants and be bored with it. It's just a lot of fun. Of course, like I've already mentioned, I'm a container gardener. And let me assure you, as someone who has done traditional in the ground, till it, turn your compost in gardening and container gardening, container gardening is 1 million percent a real garden. It is still hard work. It is still expensive. 
And it's still just as fun and magical. It's a delight. I highly recommend, even if you do have a ton of space, grabbing some containers and seeing what you can do. And there's so many fabulous resources that the library has, especially since there is more of a movement with millennials and younger of, you know, we don't necessarily have lawns. College students don't necessarily have a place to garden, but they still want something to take care of, to be beautiful in their space. There's a a real revival of house plants, and that's really a lot of fun. So we've got um, Living with Plants, a guide to indoor gardening, container theme gardens, an encyclopedia of container plants. I'm definitely a fan of the coffee table reference books, so I will absolutely recommend those on any subject to any reader, but especially with beautiful pictures of plants. And then, of course, uh, living walls are a funky, fun kind of container. But instead of just one container, you're growing up a fence or wall. And it's some really, really just neat stuff. Some more fun ideas for how to take a corner of somewhere and turn it into your own private. Uh, The Contained Gardens, Creative Design and Projects, Susan Berry and Steve Bradley, really great instructions on how to do things that I think a lot of either more advanced gardeners take it for granted or people who just go and get your, your hanging basket from Home Depot every summer. It's like, well, how do I make that basket myself? Just wonderful step-by-step instructions, lots of great descriptions and photos, really wonderful resource in that one. And of course, if you, you know, well, what do I put in my container? Great ideas in container theme gardens, literally 42 combinations of five match plants each. It's absolutely a stunning book by Nancy J. Andra. A lot of fun with that. The picture I included from her work there is called Magic in Miniature, and she made a container holding a fairy garden. Mentioned the living walls just briefly a little bit ago, and of course, um, that's what these pictures are all looking at, different ideas for it. And it can be very simple. I love the big idea for small spaces. Kay McGuire and Tony Woods included instructions for how to make a living wall. They called it a pocket wall. It's basically an over-the-door shoe rack that they've adapted to hang over the side of a railing that they've grown plants and it's beautiful it's inexpensive it's a genius idea and if you don't like it you can use the canvas for something else it's a wonderful way to upcycle something and it's just a really cool way to add a splash of color and a splash of life in a place either covering an unsightly railing or just somewhere that you'd like to have a little more zazz there's also of course the more traditional living wall made out of a pallet that you can see there. Um, in Grow a Living Wall, Create Vertical Designs with Purpose by Shauna Coronado. Really just neat, unique ideas to draw from. She recommends found objects like baskets or hats that you can hang. You can see the conical baskets that have been lined in plastic that are on that wall there. And it's like just, just a really interesting shape, texture, and color that would complement the plants really well. Really funky. And then, of course, the picture that looks like a painting or a mirror. She's just really neat round wall, basically sconce that she made for moss that brings to mind a, a Japanese Zen garden or another just kind of relaxing blend between the naturalness of moss on a, on a rock wall, but this was with a really fun, funky, modern, clean shape. It's just really cool ideas in Grow Living Wall. But some of the plants that I do have, of course, is like I had to share some of my containers because you can really have fun with them. Um, the pictures with the cats. There are just the fountain grasses and bachelor buttons and marigolds that I grew my own last summer. Had a trellis for uh, tomato plants and beans and just really made patio overlooking a parking lot feel like a private, very tropical location. It was marvelous. I love my containers. And you can also just go to town with it. I got uh, the red bat wings flowers from a gardening friend who didn't need them anymore and a dragon skull from Target on Halloween clearance. Combined the two and it made a really, really neat accent piece. So you can, containers really give you a lot of exciting options that you wouldn't necessarily consider with a traditional outdoor garden. You can really, really let your imagination run wild with the containers. Okay, say you love your plants, you love your gardens. You're not a gardener. Maybe you're married to a gardener. Maybe you've gotten your kids into gardening. But you still want something excellent to contribute to the garden. There's so many books on crafts and artwork that celebrate our gardens, that keep the garden going year round. Of course, we wouldn't be anywhere without floral embroidery. The lots of really gorgeous books, especially Hand Stitched Landscapes and Flowers by Katrina Witten. It's a newer book. It's so well done. Beautiful, beautiful projects that, of course, make me wish I liked needlework, but also really fantastic instructions. 
beautifully done pictures, very clear directions and techniques, materials needed. You could, of course, if you're an experienced embroiderer, it would have great ideas and inspiration for you. If you're less experienced and you want to try things out, the instructions really are clear enough that if you wanted to grab the project by the horns and go for it, I think you could be very successful with it. And it's, it's just a gorgeous book. If needlecraft isn't your thing, but you still want to make your own flowers, absolutely breathtaking book. Crepe Paper Flowers, Beginner's Guide to Making and Arranging Beautiful Blooms. I have never seen crepe paper flowers that look as real, as natural, and as just fun as some of the pictures and instructions included in this book. All Midwesterners love a good sunflower. That's the photo I chose out of that book. And it's just absolutely delightful. And again, this is a wonderful resource. It gives you step-by-step -step breakdown of the materials you'll need and how to use those materials to create what you want. So you can make the arrangements in the book or take those tools and run with your own imagination. And of course, crepe paper is a craft opportunity that you can do with, with littler kids that you don't want using as much with needles or scissors. It's like This is a really fun project resource for, for younger artists as well. And if you're not necessarily you know into the handcrafts, fantastic ideas in Handmade for the Garden, 75 Ingenious Ways to Enhance Your Outdoor Space, DIY Tools, Pots, Force, Embellishments. In this book, Susan Guagliumi actually shows how to make projects that are useful for the garden. A lot of it is using found objects. Like I love this picture here of a doormat which every gardener knows you need a place to scrape off the mud made out of old garden hose. So you're not only upcycling the garden hose that you didn't know what to do with, but didn't want to throw away, but it has leak in it. But now you have an awesome looking doormat. And it's just lots of really fun projects like that to make the garden uh, just a little more personalized, make some useful tools. But it's also just really fun if you want to contribute to, you know, a gardener in your life and make a project for them uh, to enhance their garden. It's really lots of great ideas. And of course, um, creating ribbon flowers. It sounds like a very uh, 80s idea to have big bows and ribbons on everything, but what is old is new again. And this book is just absolutely gorgeous, super fun. Even if you never make a ribbon flower in your life, you should absolutely enjoy the beautiful creations in this book. I just two of the pictures. One is just this stunning floral necklace. It's like you, you can hardly believe they're made out of ribbon. And then, of course, the, the carnation flower wreath that I absolutely need to try to make. Mine will not look that good. Again, just an incredibly inspiring book just for ideas and color and just the fun that we all love about our gardens. To have a good time with those florals, re-embrace them, look at them again, share them, and just have fun with the books that we have for you in the library. Just, just celebrating those things so you can have you can have garden anywhere you go, anytime of year. <laughs>